time until we say we are now recording the May 4th, 2018 Small Business Accounting Advisors. Happy May 4th. May the 4th be with you. Happy Friday. Yeah. I'm not even waiting to say yeah. that. Oh my gosh, I say that every year. Yeah. <laughs> May the 4th be with you before Cinco de Mayo. I mean, you know, how much better does it get? <laughs> so today we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to go off the subject of QuickBooks and we're going to talk a little bit about blockchain. So I'm going to share my, my screen and we will get a little introductory. Thank you to Ernest for sharing this. So bear with me for just a moment. And now I have to find where I put it on my desktop. Here it is. Oh wait, I need to unshare because I don't think I clicked the, uh, hold on a second. Share computer scan sound. I need to do that. <laughs> where you guys won't hear anything. Allowing us to do a lot of our transactions much more peer-to-peer -peer directly and Can lower our hear? use of intermediaries like companies or banks maybe. I think today everyone can leave understanding something about blockchain at some level. Do you know what we're going to talk about today? <laughs> called blockchain. What's blockchain? That's a really good question. It's actually a way that we can trade. Do you know what trade is? It's when you take turns or something. That's when you give up most of what you want, right? When you give up most of what you want? Well, sometimes <laughs> that's what happens for sure. What if I told you that there's a kind of technology that I work on that means you could trade with any kid all over the world? Really? Yeah. If I could trade with any kid, I would trade, well, I would trade something I don't like so much. That's probably a good idea. Maybe somebody else likes it more than you do. So normally when people trade, they have to go to the store or they have to know the person so that they can get what they asked for. With blockchain, you can make that exact same trade, but you don't need the store and you don't even necessarily need to know the other person. So Ian, do you know what blockchain is? No. Have you ever traded or sold anything? Actually, I'm selling my computer on eBay right now. That's amazing. What made you decide to trade on eBay? Um, well, I, I mean, I've heard of it and I trust it a lot because there's they have like all of their guarantees. So I, I know that I'm gonna get money and the person's gonna get what they want. So what if I told you that blockchain technology is basically a tool where you can do the exact same thing but it goes to you and I directly. You wouldn't need an eBay or a brand in between. That's cool. And there's a lot of those kinds of middlemen like in our society today, right? We have a lot of banks, we have yeah. a lot of companies that sort of help us make sure that our trades happen. Mm -hmm. But if we could guarantee the same trade using technology as sort of like a technological trust, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't really need all those middlemen in between. So how does it work? basically a network of computers that all have the same history of transactions. And so instead of sort of there being one company with one database that holds all the information, the same sort of list is held by all these different people, like you could have it on your computer. And then it gets validated by everyone and basically that turns into the next part of the list. So it's sort of constantly updating itself. So like, how do you make sure that it's secure? So it uses cryptography and that helps it basically encode all of the transactions. So you can't really see exactly what happened, but you know it happened because it's like a marker. So you could kind of like, I don't know, say trade you trade apples, but you would just see like random letters yeah, for it. So exactly. you wouldn't be able to like track it, I guess. Exactly. That's cool. So it's kind of this like really big ledger or accounting system for all sorts of things that get traded. But instead of being owned by one company, it's owned by everybody. That's cool. Yeah. Kind of like Cuba. Blockchain technology. <laughs> you heard of blockchain? I've heard of the words blockchain, but I'm not sure I know what it is. So when we were much smaller societies, 
you and I could trade in our community pretty easily. But as the distance in our trade grew, we ended up inventing institutions, right? Mm -hmm. If you use Uber or you use Airbnb or you use Amazon even, these are just digital marketplaces and platforms that help us facilitate an exchange of value. Mm -hmm. But today we actually have a technology that allows us to trade one-to-one -one, but at scale and it's called blockchain technology. There is some kind of interface for it. You could have an app um, or you could use your computer to do it. But instead of there being a company in the middle or what's helping you make that transaction is a bunch of software code. Okay. And so it's being run by all of these different computers that have like a node. So they're all running the same software and guaranteeing your transactions um, as they happen. I mean, I would assume this technology is taking away business or activity from these middlemen. In some cases, yeah, it is. And a lot of people in the financial industry in particular are looking at it from the banking side of how do we use this technology to trade things like Bitcoin or other tokens that okay. um, are easier to use instead of today's currency. You know, a lot of people think about blockchain as Bitcoin mm -hmm. because it's sort of in the news a lot and it's this new cryptocurrency and it's kind of exciting. But we're actually seeing a lot more use cases for blockchain that aren't around the currency side. They're more around how do you take any asset mm -hmm. and be able to trade that using the same technology. Is there a mechanism for verifying that person A is a legitimate seller or producer of the item? So today, a lot of people are working on how to create identity structures that leverage blockchains. And one of the tools for doing that is being able to cryptographically sign um, for a given attribute. So your government could sign that you have a U.S. passport or a university could sign that you are a currently enrolled student. And you could then dole out that information and control it yourself and be able to show people those certifications on an as needed basis. So today we're going to talk about blockchain technology. Okay. Have you ever I heard of blockchain? I'm stop sharing I have. If uh, whenever we have. Allows me. A yeah, that's probably enough. Say I buy something from <clears> you. <throat> this information gets logged and it gets verified by a uh, third person, third party, and then. Um, okay, now I can't get it to stop. <laughs> <laughs> what else is new? Huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you gotta stop sharing in order to get it to stop. I thought I did stop you sharing. You did stop sharing, but it's still playing. It was still playing in the background. In the background. Okay, now we're good. Yes. So it's funny that what I thought of was Qbox when he said it sinks everywhere. <laughs> this is a little different. It's a little scary in my opinion. I don't think it's scary at all. I think it's fascinating. Well, you have to be open to being able to share every aspect of your life. I'm getting there. I mean, after all, I'm a Google girl. Yeah. And Google knows everything about me. Mm -hmm. well, let me let me give you another uh, real world example. So I don't know how many of you have uh, a credit union account. I do. Um, but credit unions uh, subscribe to something called the co-op network. Yes. Uh, and it's one of the things that allows uh, financial institutions, credit <laughs> credit unions, to to look like they have a bigger ATM network than they really do. Because all of the um, all of the nodes, if you will, inside the co-op network are all linked together, and so they, they co-trust each other and they validate each other. So similar to kind of a blockchain environment, I, I might be a member of the USAA credit union, go Army, um, but I can walk over to any other credit union that's a part of the co-op network. And they trust me intuitively and allow me to withdraw money because they have this um, this means of cross communicating across them. So it's one of the fascinating things, uh, you know, uh, of blockchain is just being able to kind of build that larger network. And I use that example 
because uh, my background in credit unions, they're actually building out the authentication level uh, using blockchain currently. Mm-hmm. Dennis, your opinion? Well, I could see a couple things that would make it difficult to be adopted. One is that people that are middlemen as their profession probably be somewhat undelighted with the prospect of <laughs> losing their job to uh, technology. Add, adding that cost layer. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. right? And, and, and the consumer, I'm del- I am delighted at losing that middleman and losing that extra cost. The other thing that I would be a little concerned about is you saw what happened with the 2008 crash where people were involved with you know, technology in a way they didn't really understand and the things that happened in terms of, and so I guess my concern, you know, maybe a sort of an anxiety level for society as a whole is that we don't really understand how this works. It's kind of like a black box kind of thing. We're just going on faith. And how do we know and what happens if, say, the technology is disrupted or gets corrupted or, or what have you? It's like a lot of times you can't really, you can't really foresee the problems until they actually happen. Because it's such a, you know, dynamic interplay of different, you know, confluences. And, and, and I want to say that um, technology is moving so fast that there are people that are now out in the world that have no memory of 2008. <laughs> I know. Oh, I do. <laughs> we do. We're a little bit more mature, but the younger folks, the 20-year-olds, Mm. you know they didn't hear the wailing and gnashing of teeth and and what were they 10 when it happened yeah Yeah. so 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 i i don't think you can stop it i mean i think that you know technology is evolving and i i don't think it's going to be able you know you're just going to be able to ignore it but i know from what i've heard and read about auditors that it could make the need for auditors you know, not as pressing in terms of checking transactions and right. validating transactions. So that's, that's the way I look at it. I look at it as there's, you know, there's so many transactions that we have in just business. Um, and it's not just moving money, but an invoice. Mm-hmm. I have an invoice. It says I sold this widget and that widget and I owe you or now you owe me, you know, a certain amount of money. Right. Okay. Um, those transactions, if I envision that they're posted on multiple ledgers so that nobody can manipulate them, nobody can lie, nobody can, can come in and say, wasn't that, it wasn't that vendor, it was this vendor, or, uh, I really didn't ship you if three us, you know, and then, so the trust comes in or, or real estate. That's another perfect one. When you do a real estate closing, I, yeah. I can remember a friend of mine that, that worked out at the courthouse in the records and um, it was all looking it up by hand and doing the title searches. Oh yeah. I used everything. to work for, a, I worked for a title insurance company about 40 years yeah. ago. Yeah. So, and, and that's the same for invoices. I remember when you had to keep track of invoice numbers. Numbers. Right. Exactly. So what I'm, envisioning, what I'm envisioning is whenever there's a transaction and when so they're trading, they're, they're you know, um, if I uh, send you an invoice, you now have a payable, okay? And that this ledger idea keeps them in balance and keeps everybody in check because say it's recorded on, whether you're, you're calling them nodes or something, say it's on nine different nodes. One of the nodes reports back that it's different, you know. So that it's it's an integrity thing. So when you look at the audits, an auditor, okay, they audit presentation and and and, and the figures, but so, that would almost do away with doing Yeah, the, but I'd say that audit. takes away a big control thing because what if you are in control of somebody's books and an invoice was sent out and it was for item A when it should have been for item but that's B. That's where the blockchain technology should prevent that. Should. Should. <laughs> should and does 
Yeah, well, and then that's the where that's where the technology. Work. You know, how do you one um, uh, verify that who's talking is the right person talking? The other is that they're reporting the right information. You know, right out of the right out of the shoot. But you know, you've got a purchase order that matches a packing slip, which matches. You know, right now there's a disconnect with all these pieces of information. So. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, it, you know, if you record the purchase, they're talking about trading assets. So I'll trade you cash to pay my payable or, or, or whatever. Um, and it's a permanent record. It can never, ever be edited. I like that idea. In other words, once it happens, there's no room for somebody to come in. Now, okay. well, the other reason people, that, that uh, entities may not like it is because it it's, it pulls controlling uh, interest out, like banks controlling information, media controlling information, uh, government. Well, if you read Doug's leader's article, right? I mean, Doug talks a lot about um, it impeing, uh, impacting the accounting industry, you know, with respect to you've got this big ledger out there. And now, right, you can uh, you can hook up the accounting system so that accounting system talks to accounting system. You, you don't have to do the data entry. Now the information is just rolling straight in. You're like, right. all right, what was my profitability today? Well, right. it seems like it could uh, maybe reduce fraud to some extent if you're going to get rid of the manual, manual intervention to, you know, yeah. sabotage the books. Right. One question but, I would have, though, is that you know, when you look at it from a cryptocurrency standpoint, I mean, like the government uses the money supply to control the economy. How is that going to be impacted? You know, can yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's an interesting point. And because you won't have that ability to kind of, if you will, manipulate the money supply anymore. Right, exactly. That's, that's the big picture question that you know, you're spot on. And, you know, is that healthier for the world because now you're not manipulating it? Um, certainly, I think you're going to have a little bit more um, – ups and downs so it'll be a little more rugged uh, individualism well i know for example right now it's assumed it's going to be unbreakable but you know during the second world war with the germans they had the uh, their code they thought was unbreakable and right. it was it, it would be broken you know well so, if nobody remembered the 2008 recession dennis no one is going to remember world war II. Well, I, I was a, my degree is in history so i've got a bit of a bias <laughs> i love you I, I'm, I'm teasing you, actually, <laughs> but I understand the point. I do well, the the sad you're... thing is we only live, what, 70 to 90 years, and mistakes that were made, say, 70 to 90 years ago witnessed the Depression, you know, in the 20s, that people think, well, this time it's going to be different. But it's, never, <laughs> but it's, it's usually not different. And so Larry has a comment. When the government gets involved, you can imagine there may be info shared that you may not care to. We've talked about that a little bit. Also may bring on the, you will not be able to buy or sell without the mark. So what happens if you're but not isn't, certified? But isn't one of the things about blockchain is the, is the governments can't own it. That's right. That's right. And that's, that's absolutely right. And yeah. that's, that's the magic as far as I'm concerned. You don't have, you know, any government controlling the currency. Yeah. I think that's important. But you know what? So as cool as this all sounds, and the banks and, and all these corporations are putting millions and millions of dollars into research and development and how we're going to use it and everything, and it's going so fast. But then yet we're in the trenches trying to do regular transactions for regular little businesses and we're fighting the dumbest things, you know? And, you know, one of the things, uh, Australia, they don't do checks. I mean, they're so far ahead of us. We're still handwriting <laughs> and, and driving to banks, you know? I mean, we have a lot of catching up to do. And, um, hey, there's my name. And uh, so anyway, so, so I had the, the demo for the auto entry. So another AI, you know, four documents, it'll read the documents. I wanted to look at it because it's rare to find anything that'll talk to desktop, QuickBooks desktop. But what I noticed halfway through the demo, I'm like, it doesn't do this and this and this and this and this. <laughs> and I said to the guy, do you look at your competitors? 
do you know what your competitors do? Mm-hmm. Because I said, HubDoc does this, LedgerSync does this, you do this. So I know it's all possible. So we're all looking at this going, well, so-and-so can do it. And so-and-so could do this little piece of the puzzle. So-and-so could do that little piece. If y'all would just get together, we might be able to get some. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, you know, so yes, the technology is going 100 miles an hour. But here we have somebody else who's entered the market reading documents and pushing to accounting yet another company so i mean i don't want a monopoly or you know it's like but i it's so i like i like the competition but i just well, it just surprises me that as some as point, this I stuff think- is going it's like <laughs> user interface do, do any of your programmers sit down and actually use it <laughs> we had that conversation earlier ernest <laughs> Speaking as a developer. Well, go ahead, Dennis. You were going to say something? I mean, some of you may remember the uh, video I showed you uh, with uh, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, Mickey Mouse. And the, <laughs> when, yeah. I was in, when I was a sophomore in college, my history professor said that he made that analogy that Western society and technology was, is like that in terms of not being able to control it and getting out of hand. And so that would be my concern is something that's invented by humans can is going to be invariably imperfect. And a lot of times you can't foresee consequences until after the fact. And so, and you have given up your control. You have yeah. given up your control as to how to classify something. And it could be something as stupid as, um, this is a computer expense. No, it's a dues and subscriptions. Yeah. Software, SaaS software could be categorized either way at this point. Well, I look at technology as a tool that can be used for good or evil. I mean, look at social media. There's a lot of positive things about it, but then there's some not so great things about it too. So, and I don't think that was anticipated when it was developed. How uh, many people here? <laughs> here watch the TV show person of interest no okay because there they had all these cameras all around and the guy had written a program and the program just did everything and it was all done with numbers and it would tell them who was going to get killed or whose life was in danger <laughs> it would go out and save his algorithm huh? control <laughs> So, we went to see what we went to see last night. Player, Ready Player One. Ready Player One. <laughs> it was really good, especially if you know a lot of the '70s and '80s music and and oh, yeah. and you know pop culture and stuff. And and uh, what was the other one? The uh, uh, what was it with the grenade? The Mighty Python. Okay, but oh, yeah. the idea was that that the society started doing the virtual reality wearing the glasses yeah. you know and then they and i thought well that's basically, addictive is you're basically you life. you would escape from your life that you don't like and go into this reality game and um but what was cool was um uh at the very end they decided to turn it off on like tuesdays and thursdays or something just to force society to actually take the damn things off and talk to one another, <laughs> <interact>, you know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, you know, sometimes so I think they're, G- they're good and sometimes it's just like, it becomes so like a trap. I, I think, Gina, you wanted to talk about, like, all these, you know, it, SaaS software, and so you get all of these updates these days, yeah. which are, um, I think I was, uh, before we uh, – um, disruptive we earlier extremely. we were just talking about you know how disruptive it is to you know real accountants in the trenches who are actually trying to build procedures around stuff and they write a procedure this week and <laughs> you know the clever programmer comes and says well let's change the workflow this will be better mm-hmm. uh with almost no announcement of that no announcement. Uh, yeah and, and, it's like, and no instructions once it's been done yeah you so you know, the, the, the old guy in me just has to just laugh out loud because when I started my career, we st- I started on the mainframe. 
And that's exactly the environment we had in the mainframe. So yep. one great big circle, as far as I'm concerned, we started with this environment where you had no control. You walked in one day and the screen changed and you didn't know why. And, and then you went to complete control. And uh, so now we've moved more to a hybrid model, which I, you know, I think that I would continue to insist upon a hybrid model because that's the evolved nature. I mean, um, I, I love Microsoft's uh, slogan for quite a while now, software plus services. Um, and I think that's a big differentiator from, you know, just giving complete control over to the machine. Uh, because you have developers out there whose entire livelihood depends on not fixing this bug, but creating the feature that will sell five more licenses. It's all about the money. Right. And five more right. licenses. Mm -hmm. um, Do, does anybody remember the book Future Shock from the 1970s? Oh, yeah. Yes. I mean, that's, that's kind of scenario I see is how fast can you adapt to all this change <laughs> without having, you know, health consequences. And and they're not fixing what they've already done. Oh, agile. <laughs> well. Yeah. What do you say, Mark? <laughs> Hi. Hey, Mark. He's at a winery. No, it was <laughs> He's taking happy hours. <laughs> they call this happy hour, right? I'm supposed You're to right. be happy. Happy hour. Happy hour. The glass is empty, you know, dude. Like you need a refill, Ernest. Hey, uh, you guys are slowing me down. I got to get to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> we are just about over. We have like five minutes left. Um, <clears throat> let me see. We, we were going to talk about an accounting issue. How about that? Um, how many people have taken entertainment off of their chart of accounts. Um, not not profits, not not everybody else. Yeah. Entertainment. Entertainment's no longer an well, expense. Well, I have meals, comma, client related, meals, client, or meals, comma, uh, company related, related or company related. And then I have um, entertainment. Doesn't mean they can't, they're not going to do it, just means it's not deductible. I was just going to say, I mean, I think se segregating them yeah. um, is the most appropriate course of action. Just separate it and let, yeah. I know many people that are still going to do it. <laughs> well, well, Even if it's well, not deductible. an argument. They're, they're, it's still too vague and they're going to clarify yeah. it. But as it stands yeah. today, it's not clarified. They haven't yeah. read the rules but, for but the But the standard Q chart of accounts still has an account called Meals and entertainment. entertainment does not exist anymore. Mm, does yeah. not exist I have anymore. have entertainment separate, and it says entertainment 0%. And then I have the different meals ones. Meals, uh, you know, annual party for employees is 100%. No. Meals Nothing's is 100%. Nothing's 100% anymore. Nothing is 100% anymore. Nothing. Okay, so my question. Um, 50%. Excuse my language for putting it the way I'm getting ready to put it, you know, for future Sweet. reference. What the hell is the difference between Eve and entertainment? You still gonna have fun? <laughs> well, okay, that is the argument. If you, right. if you go into the code, the yeah. code was originally written, if you read it, that meals and entertainment with a customer is entertainment. Okay. The meal is entertainment. Okay, and you had to have a business purpose to make it deductible at all. Got it. But it was still considered if you if you are having a meal with with a client, it's it is entertainment. Okay. Hey, can I can I write this line off? <laughs> <laughs> I'm having it with you guys. That's right. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> Travel related, so should it be fifty percent? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, but that's employee. There's no difference anymore between it's either company related with your own employees or outside your company. Right. Okay. They're both fifty percent, but the argument is they haven't solidified defining client meals. 
okay? So there's a danger there, but I don't think they ever intended to do away with um, the, the, you know, taking the client to dinner. The thing, the thing is, if it's, if it's anything where you actually can't sit there and talk about, you know, if you want to, eat, the eating is secondary to what, why you're meeting. Like if you're watching a Lakers basketball, basketball No, game. that's entertainment. See, that's, <laughs> what, that's what I'm saying. Right. You have to logically say, are you having a business meeting? You just happen to be eating. Got it. Yeah. So the moral of the story is take that entertainment away from meals, whether you use it or not. Right. I know many, many people do not use the entertainment and they just leave the standard chart of account just the way it is. Meals and entertainment. And they're not going to worry about yeah. it, but it could cause problems in the future. It could cause a trigger point and say, hey, what's this? What do you have in this account? You now have to explain it. Right. Can I ask a question, you all? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so my niche primarily is dealing with truckers and construction. Um, and since they've taken away the per diem for company drivers through the, the jobs act for those that are over the road drivers they, they would normally be able to expense those to, to write to expense those things and um they'll be tax deductible so that's not for them anymore either for the over the road drivers or, or those or those over the road um construction i think firms. we need dennis for this i don't know that's a tax question i don't know yeah yeah, yeah i don't is, do taxes either because uh, I, I still have it on the chart of accounts for the, for the bookkeeping side. Yes. Because it's not, I'm not, I'm just not clear. It's not clear. Right. That I think is the problem in a nutshell, Camille. It's just mm. not clear. Yeah. It's just not clear to a lot of people. Well, we can't mm. rely on these canned chart of accounts either. That just because the software came with a chart of accounts that this is the way it should be. You still need to do your own little right exactly the nonprofit chart the accounts meal well. categories and i explained to the bookkeepers and the staff people doing it you want to pick the one that re reflects what happened and i also pointed out to them because we got an email from the cpa saying you actually have to have the actual receipt you can't use a statement i did not realize that oh that's another you know what and it, we had a little thing on facebook going the other day because Expensify states that you don't need a receipt under 75. That is absolutely false. Right. False. For travel expenses other than lodging, there is, there is, there is, uh, in the, you know, where, where they're not going to look at anything under 75, but that is strictly travel. And somehow that morphed into any expenses under 75. Absolutely not true. You, you have to prove the what not not when how much and where you spend it but the why and the what right and you can't do that without the actual receipts you just right. can't absolutely okay so okay. we're going to end on that and we will see you all same time same place next week we will bye have a great one everyone bye, you all